Another podcast. I think you're going to love this one. Today we're going to be talking to Elmer D. McGinnis. He's written a book called Nevada Gunsmoke, uh, Frontier Fighters of the Boomtown Years from 1850 to 1890. Um, and of course, before we get into the podcast, I want to thank my friends over at the Tombstone Epitaph. That is Arizona's longest running newspaper. And uh, you can reach them over at tombstoneepitaph.com. And, uh, you know, if you love a newspaper delivered right to your door, especially an historic Old West newspaper and you touch it, you feel it, you can be a part of it. That's what's amazing about a newspaper because you're getting the epitaph, the same paper that the Earps and Doc Holliday and everybody got to see and all the players in Tombstone they got to read was all from the Tombstone epitaph. And you can get that delivered right to your, tour, right to your door um, for 25 bucks for one year. I think it's 50 bucks or 55 and then $60 for the third year. The third year is definitely the way to go. You save $15 overall. I also want to thank my friends at the uh, Wild West History Association. This is the best way to connect with history writers, researchers, historians, is becoming a member of the Wild West History Association. I'm a member. I, I know that Elmer is. And you can reach them at wildwesthistory.org. It's uh, about 75 bucks for one year, but you get the journal. And the journal is 105 plus pages of all Western history, research, true provenance, and it comes right to your door. And if you were to pay, you know, $20 for this journal, that would be $80 a year and you can join for 75. So it's, you know, it's a great deal. And plus you get people like Elmer and John Bosnecker and, and Roy B. Young and uh, Casey T. Fertiller. I mean, you get these amazing people that are all part of Wild West History Association. And again, you can join at wildwesthistory.org. Now, Elmer's book kind of flew by me on Facebook, and it was in a Wild West History group. I think it was the uh, wildwesthistory.org, where he released the book in January of this year. Uh, I saw the book go by me, and I was like, hmm, that looks kind of interesting. I don't know much about Nevada uh, 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 gunfighters and outlaws, and uh, and here's a book that piqued my interest. Now, if you wish to buy the book, uh, you can do so at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or booksellers near you, or you can buy it right at Schuster.com. Where does your publisher sell, uh, sell it? It's, uh, it's McFarlandPub.com. McFarlandPub.com. So there's a lot of ways to get the book, and one of them, like I said, for me was Amazon, and it took right to the door. And uh, it's a beautiful book. And again, it's a little bit on the oversized because it's got big. It's got the bigger font, which I like, and it's it's just got a bigger look to it. So it's not the size of a small book. It's just a little bit bigger than that. And uh, it's got some fantastic history in it, amazing photos in it. I think you're going to love the book. When Elmer and I, yeah. yeah, when Elmer and I got to talking, we decided that there was there's 15 stories in 14 chapters. Did I get that right? 15 stories, that's, 14 chapters. That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 14 chapters, uh, Two. One chapter uh, deals with two characters at once. We're related, kind of related. So, uh, yeah, fifteen altogether characters. And and then there is a ton of reference in the book. I mean, just an amazing amount. You could actually write a book just on your on your reference alone. Um, there is uh, so much there at the very at the back of the book. Um, it's fantastic. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there's so much history in it just in that part. So when we, we spoke about it, we decided to speak about Hank Parrish, uh, Dick Prentice, and Rattlesnake Dick Darley. And each one of those men are in the book. They have a fantastic story, and we're going to talk about them with Elmer. Now, Elmer, how long have you been into Western history? You've been into it for a long time, I think, back to NOLA and WOLA. Yeah, I go back to the uh, beginning of NOLA. I was one of the original members. Uh, which goes back to, I believe, the early uh, 18, uh, 18, sorry, wow. 1980s. That's a long way. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, one of the first uh, members of Lola uh, mm -hmm. when they uh, organized. And so that we're talking, I guess, 40-some uh, some, some years now. Wow. So you've been doing this a long time. So when, when you've been long enough, so when you go... To events or anything, is it? Uh, pe do people whisper your name? There's Elmer. Oh my God! There's Elmer. No, <laughs> no, not well. We're gonna have to change that. <laughs> and I'm glad that doesn't happen because uh, 
I'm not, I'm not really into the fame type of thing, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm more of a quiet guy, so I like to, I like to keep it that way. But, uh, actually with this book and, uh, with this podcast now, you never know what might happen. Right. There, people are going to be, you're going to be at, uh, Chick fil A or someplace and somebody's going to step right aside. There's Elmer. Um, <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> but you wrote the book and you decided to write. Why, why, why write a book about the Nevada gun smoke? Why write about them? Because, but you also write, you specialize in outlaw and lawmen, correct? That's right, yeah. Um, hey, like so I why this it, book? Uh, crime, crime and law enforcement in the Old West. And I picked uh, uh, Nevada um, there, because there's all kinds of stuff written about other places like Kansas, you know, uh, mostly because of the Earps, probably, and B- Bat Masterson and whatnot. There's lots there. Texas, there's lots. Oklahoma, there's lots. Um, but one of my special interests is characters that have never been, uh, researched or written about before. And I kind of uh, look at it a bit and I said, nobody's written anything about Nevada, really. There's been a few, there's been a few books on Nevada, of course, like Phil Earl's books, which mentions some of the outlaws, but it's more of like a social history. Same as Sally Zanjani, it's more a social history of the, of the mining camps, which, which mentions uh, outlaws and lawmen in passing, but nothing, nothing in detail. I believe actually this is probably the first book um, that I know of, at least anyway, that has dealt with uh, uh, gunfighters of Nevada uh, specifically. Because your writing style is a lot like Peter Brand, not style, but like Peter Brand to where he researches the people in the background. And that's kind of what you're doing too. So it's good to know that those people that aren't mainstream actually have a place in history and, and you're writing about them. Yeah. Um, and actually it's interesting. You mentioned Peter Brand because he's actually one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite researchers. And that's when I was coming along deciding I was going to do this, some, some writing, some research and writing on these characters. I kind of take little, little bits of uh, writing styles uh, from the writers that I like and the research that I like, and Peter Brand is one of them. So, uh, so yeah, there's probably a little bit of Peter Brand style in there. So let's jump into it because we had a lot to talk about, and we can't talk about Peter even though Peter would <laughs> like that. Um, Hank Parrish was dubbed Nevada's worst killer. Um, he arrived sometime in Nevada around the 1870s. Um, he was born in 1840 in Nova Scotia, which is part of Canada. Although people in Nova Scotia, do they say that they're part of Canada? Yes, they do actually they? do. It's, uh, yeah, it's, okay. uh, you might be talking more about Newfoundland. Who, Newfoundland. Uh, besides there's they're something on their own type of thing. Gotcha. And, and then on top of that, he ends up with some children in Oregon, but there is just a huge story. So tell us about Hank Parrish. Tell us his story. Uh, yeah, so like you said, he, he arrived in uh, Nevada, probably in the mid mid to late 1870s. Um, he, the first time we hear about him is in uh, southern Nevada, south of Las Vegas, in the heart of the desert, uh, a place called El Dorado Canyon. Um, it was a, a mining area, but actually when he arrived there, there had only been one other group of miners that uh, actually had moved in there to do to do any work at all in the mining area, and he came in uh, with the second group, him and uh, three or four other partners. And uh, of course, uh, mining was the the reason he was there. But uh, the type of character he was, of course, he was uh, in the saloons most evenings, uh, drinking and playing cards and uh, and getting into trouble that way, and. Uh, it was one day in 1879, uh, one of the nefarious characters who he came across in the saloon shot one of his partners. And then this fellow uh, decided he better get out of there. So he, he went off walking into the desert, which isn't a good idea to begin with. Uh, but uh, Hank Parrish simply uh, jumped on his horse, uh, rode after him, and uh, c- came up to him and shot him to death. Um, there wasn't much... Uh, Hullabaloo over this at the time because this character was actually uh, 
a kind of a nefarious guy who they decided, you know, good riddance to bad rubbish kind of thing. And there wasn't much law enforcement uh, in that area at the time anyway. So uh, Parrish kind of got got uh, got away with that one. Um, he shot another fellow over a, a dispute over a card game in uh, September of 1879. And once again, um, the fellow's name was Taylor. Now, we don't know his first name, but his last name was Taylor. And uh, he wasn't considered one of the upstanding members of the community that they had there at that time either. So um, nobody said uh, much about that. So H- Hank Parrish continued on his way. Um, but I, later, later, I want to interject something before you get going too far. May I? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Sure. So, El Dorado Canyon. I was surprised in my research about your book that El Dorado Canyon is still there. So, it is. Yeah. If somebody, if you're in the Searchlight area, you're south of Boulder City, Nevada, and you're in the right. Searchlight area. You can actually go to El Dorado Canyon and see this exact area. Now, it may, it's changed a lot because there's a paved road, but the desert around it is still there, and you can see the town of El Dorado. So it's really important. If you got folks are listening to this and he's talking about some of the towns, a lot of the towns are still there for you to go research and see, and, uh, and I urge you to do it because that's the one thing about your book. I'll say this about your book is Elmer gave a lot of description in the about the towns and the cities that these people went to. And it made me go through Google and say, I got to Google and found out these towns and cities are still there. So thank you for the details. I appreciate that a bunch. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and when we made our trips down to Nevada, we visited some of these sites as well. Now, we didn't make it uh, into El Dorado Canyon, unfortunately, but uh, by the sounds of things, it would be a good place to uh, to visit. But a lot of the other places that uh, we mentioned in the book, we actually visited, and it gives you a re- real feel feel of the uh, the atmosphere. And even though, like you say, things have changed, and uh, you still get little bits of uh, what it would have been like at that time. So as Hank Parrish is moving around, he's doing things. He he kills a man. I don't think that man was uh, Arch Stewart, was it? Uh, he killed Art Stewart later. Later? He did. Okay. Well, well, the, there was a conspiracy theory, it's believed, and if he didn't actually pull the trigger, he was one of the conspiracists. It's uh, probably most definite on that, but he was involved in Art Stewart's death. Hmm. And he's buried out near Las Vegas somewhere. He is, yes. Crazy. So continue. I didn't mean, you can continue on. I just wanted people to know that you put a lot of description in the towns and cities and it makes it very easy to research. So you can not only use the book to learn about Nevada's, uh, notorious gunfighters and outlaws, but you can also use the book as a travel guide and go to the places that Elmer went to. Yeah, that's great, Mike. Uh, um, I appreciate your words on that and uh, yeah, that was awesome. a lot of research. Went right into it, so. So, can, so what else do we got to know about Hank? Yeah, so he's still he's still operating in El Dorado Canyon in the in the early eighteen eighties. Um, now he gets into another fight on February twenty eighth, eighteen eighty one. Um, again, a dispute over cards. This time, however, he shoots a more upstanding member of the community, who is a well liked fellow named James Greenwood. And he actually shot a Greenwood. He shot Greenwood and also a, a, a black man named Clark. And this this got him into a little bit more trouble. Um, there's an interesting story attached to that. Um, Greenwood, uh, after he was wounded, uh, he he wasn't killed. He was uh, wounded. He's laying on his uh, cot, and he's giving his statement of the shooting to uh, a fellow named Fife. Who just ha- who was the coroner of that co- of Lincoln County, and he just happened to be in the area at the time, so he was taking Greenwood's uh, statement. And as this is happening, all of a sudden, uh, Hank Parrish walks in the door with a gun in each hand, and he says to Fife, uh, "That man, referring to Greenwood, 
owes me, I can't remember how much it was, like $110 or something because he, he felt that Greenwood had cheated him at cards. And he said he wants it. He wants it right now. So Fife couldn't think of anything else to do. He just reached into Greenwood's pocket, took out $110, $110 gave it to uh, uh, Parrish, and Parrish was happy with that. He turned around and walked back out the door. Hmm. Um, now Gre- Greenwood and Clark did uh, both manage to survive their wounds, and Parrish uh, decided he better hightail it out of the area at this point because uh, now there's a little bit more concern over his shooting of Greenwood and uh, so he's not he's not uh, caught or prosecuted for this shooting um, but this is when he becomes uh, more so an outlaw um, before he was a minor type gunman uh, character but uh, at this point he uh, organized a little band of his own and they uh, started uh, delving into horse theft and cattle theft and um this is when he had contact with Arch Stewart. Uh, Arch Stewart was a prominent uh, rancher uh, near Las Vegas. And he, him, uh, Parrish and his crew stole some of Arch Stewart's horses at one point. Um, so that took place uh, later. Uh, uh, Stewart uh, is off uh, delivering some uh, produce because he was also a, a freighter. Um, a fellow who worked for Stewart, uh, felt he wasn't uh, getting his pay. So he was uh, complaining to Stewart's wife. Um, and so he, uh, gave Stewart's wife a talking to, and then left the area and went to, a, to the Kyle ranch. Uh, the Kyles were also a well-known ranching family. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the father was fairly upright, but the sons were a little bit, uh, a little bit more uh, shady, and apparently they had dealings with Parrish. Uh, so this this fellow went to the, the Kyle Ranch, and it's believed this was part of the conspiracy. Um, hmm. now, Kyle was that, wanted to get... Was that all sorry, near Las ahead. Vegas? This this all happened uh, near Las Vegas. Yeah, so if somebody's, the, 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 yeah, if somebody's listening, right, the, the Stewart Ranch, I believe, was in North Las Vegas, out... Near, near where Nellis Air Force Base is at. but Yeah, that's right. But if somebody's reading this and they can picture in their mind Las Vegas not being there, but, you know, where the casinos are at, and it's just open desert because the springs for Las Vegas, people don't know, the springs are where the Luxor is at. And that's really why people were in the valley was for the water. There was a lot of water there. And if you could imagine that, so these ranches that Elmer's talking about are in the area where we visit Las Vegas today. And the Stewart Ranch, I believe, was in the north part of Las Vegas, in north Las Vegas. Is that right, or am I wrong? That's, that's uh, No, you're right there, yeah, that's right. So if you can imagine that, yeah. all this ranching is going on, and you've got Parrish running around, and what we now consider Las Vegas. Crazy. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly right. Um, so anyway... Uh, Arch Stewart comes home and his wife tells him what this fellow had said to her and uh, things, different things he had said and so he's furious about this so he gets on his horse and rides to the Kyle Ranch um, it's, it's, there's a controversy as to what actually happened at the Kyle Ranch um, some believe he, he, he actually was just outright uh, ambushed and shot and killed when he got there Others believe there was a, an exchange of shots. But at any rate, um, a few hours later, after Stewart had left the ranch, a co- one of Kyle's cowboys rides up to uh, uh, the Stewart ranch mm-hmm. and gives his wife uh, a note. Mm-hmm. And the note says, uh, come, come, to the, come to the Kyle ranch. Uh, your husband is dead. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not good. So she's... <laughs> no. So she sends a wagon, and sure enough, uh, Stuart has been killed. And she sees, uh, she gets there and says, where's my husband? And Hank Parrish is there at the time. And so is uh, old man Kyle. That was uh, what he was called, old man Kyle. And they said, well, there he is laying there. Um, so Stuart was, I mean, uh, sorry, Parrish was there at the time. And it 
what a perfect, what more of a perfect character could there be to 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 uh, kill someone than, than Parrish, who who that's right up his alley. So if if there was a conspiracy, it's believed, and if Stu, if uh, Parrish didn't pull the trigger, mm-hmm. he was actually part of this conspiracy. Hmm. Well, to to move things along, it it I read that Hank um, died by hanging on December thirteenth, eighteen ninety. Is that correct? That's right. That's correct. In Ely, Nevada. In Eli, 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 Nevada. Eli. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I think it, uh, I think it's, it's Eli, Eli or Ellie. Hmm. Well, that's a it's a it's a remote spot. It's not like you know. I I looked at it on the map. So he was hung. And what were the reasons? Why was he Why was he hung? Um, he was hung actually for stabbing to death. Um, P. G. Thompson. In Royal City, which is which was another mining camp near Piosh. Uh he had got into a fight in a saloon with uh, Thompson, and uh, he stabbed him to death on August third, eighteen ninety. Wow. And this this time he did end up in court. There was a court process took place, and he was convicted and sentenced to hang. And thus, uh, he was hung to death. Uh, on December thirteenth, eighteen ninety, in Ely, uh, Eli, Ely, Nevada. Well, if you want more about the book, we're talking about Nevada Gunsmoke uh, by Elmer D. McGillis uh, with Loretta Ritchie McGin- McGinnis. Excuse me, McGinnis and McGinnis, uh, yeah. Elmer D. McGinnis. And um, you can find the book at booksellers near you, and it's called Nevada Gunsmoke: The Frontier Fighters of the Boom Years from eighteen fifty to eighteen ninety. Uh, next up we're going to talk about is a man named Dick Prentice. He was considered the best fighter in Nevada, and he was a miner and a mine guard, as well as many other things. Um, what can you tell us about Dick Prentice? Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, there's two different uh, impressions uh, you get uh, when you research Dick Prentice. Like you said, one newspaper called him the best uh, fighter in Nevada, which which he probably was. Um, but another one, uh, his physical description, which this is from Wells Drury, who was a newspaper editor in Nevada. And uh, if, I, if I remember it rightly, he said something like uh, he called Prentice a silent, uh, saddling, sidling little shotgun miner and a, a little dried up looking fellow. Hmm. So definitely his reputation didn't match his uh, physical appearance. Um, but, uh, yeah, you're right. He was a, he was a mine guard. Mostly he would be hired to, uh, to do regular mine work like the other miners. However, uh, whenever there was uh, a, a gun ham needed, uh, he was definitely one to, to do that. Um, he, the first time we hear of him, like in most of these characters, uh, is, uh, with a, with a shooting scrape, uh, um, he shot at a fellow named O'Connell in 1864. Um, there was a bunch of rocks falling on O'Connell's roof from the, from the mine, the White and Murphy mine where, uh, Prentice worked. And, uh, he, he complained about this. And a few hours later, uh, uh, Prentice shows up at his window and fires a shot at him. Um, now, uh, there was a little bit of a court controversy over this, but Prentice managed to get out of that scrape. He ends up in the uh, Virginia City Water Wars in 1870. And uh, this, of course, in the desert, you can imagine water is a very important uh, commodity. Um, mm. One of the companies that were that was providing water to uh, Virginia City, Montana at the time, uh, they were leasing uh, water from a, an, an unused uh, mine shaft or, or a mine area, at least anyway, Um the lease, the lease that they were uh, leasing the mine under, uh, was under renegotiation, and the company, the water company, decided they didn't want to pay it. So all of a sudden, water is shut off. Um, it was a year where water was in short supply at any rate, and so another mining, another water company, rather, formed and uh, decided that they would try and provide water to the community which is sorely needed, not only for mining purposes, but for drinking water and sprinkling the streets and everything. Um, so that they end up in a feud with this other water company, 
concerning property rights and equipment and so on. And uh, both both companies hired uh, fighters. Uh, Dick Prentice was one of the uh, fighters hired by one of the water companies. And there was a big shooting scrape uh, just uh, south of Virginia City in 1870 um, that he was involved in. Um, there wasn't much uh, court activity over that. Uh, things were settled out of court. Uh, but then in 1872, he gets into a dispute with a, a fellow named Patrick O'Rourke in Gold Hill, which was uh, uh, just very close to Virginia City. Only about a, They were only about a mile apart. And he shot and killed uh, O'Rourke in 1872. Um, it was a it was a very messy a messy thing. If you read the the newspaper articles, um, there was blood, and brains, and guts all over the wall where this fellow had been shot with a close range with a shotgun. So I mean, it, a lot of people have the impression it's like the movies. You know, somebody gets shot and everything's clean and. And nice afterwards and all that, but uh, it's not really the case. It was in a lot of cases there was a big mess to clean up afterwards. Um, well, it said he managed to get, it said in your yeah. book that he killed Patrick O'Rourke with a shotgun blast. He was close enough that it nearly cut him in two. Yeah, a messy as you can imagine, a messy scene. Wow. So what else do we need uh, to know? Because there's a lot of stuff. There's a defining moment that you wrote about in 1874. You got a lot of stuff on this guy. Yeah, there was uh, the Waller defeat fight in 1874. The Waller defeat was another uh, mine that uh, Prentice worked for, and he had been hired because two mining uh, companies were having a dispute. Um, Actually, it was over who would run a particular mine, uh, who was going to be the superintendent and so on. And both factions had hired fighters. Um, there ended up being, it was a big shootout. Uh, four people were killed in that particular encounter. Um, Prentice was uh, highly suspected. And of course, he, um, it's pretty definite that by research he was involved. However, uh, he was not indicted on that one. So... Uh, he, he continued on. Um, there's actually a funny incident. Uh, a fellow newspaper editor named Arthur McEwen, who was uh, friends with uh, Wells Drury, uh, he was new to Virginia City, and he was sitting in a saloon, and Prentice walked up to him and, you know, said, uh, uh, new fellow in town, well, let's have a drink together. And McEwen was new. He didn't know who Prentice was. So he told him to, to get lost, you know, he'd, he'd invite uh, people he wanted to drink with. And Prentice was so taken aback by this, he walked off and went into the corner. And afterwards, uh, Wells Drury and his other friends uh, told McEwen that he had just told off uh, Dick Prentice. Well, McEwen was uh, quite worried about this because he thought he was going to be uh, shot. So he... Uh, decided he was going to uh, go to Prentice and apologize, but they convinced him not to. His friends convinced him not to because what the reputation uh, he would gain from having done that to Dick Prentice. And Prentice didn't do anything because uh, it said that he said uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with uh, a fellow who didn't uh, have enough sense to be afraid of him. Mm. So it's that's the, uh, you know, the reputation that he had. Hmm. Now, there was a story about a gentleman named Jerry Mulligan and that Dick sought him out and all it was was over money. Yeah, this was in 1890. Um, Prentice had uh, got into some financial dealings with uh, Jerry Mulligan, who was another uh, rancher just outside of Virginia City. And he believed, uh, Prentice believed Mulligan owed him money. So one day he went to Mulligan's ranch and uh, attempted to collect the money. Uh, but Mulligan decided uh, he wasn't going to pay. And with somebody like Prentice, he didn't want to. He didn't want to take a, any chances. He didn't want to fool around. So he just uh, opened the door, uh, presented his firearm, and shot uh, Prentice dead. Hmm. 
But he took it in the stomach and the, and the, and nearly cut him in half, just like before when he killed Patrick O'Rourke. So kind of fate right. comes back, karma comes back, and literally takes Dick Prentice out exactly the same way. Yeah, that was known. Uh, Prentice's uh, favorite weapon was known to be a sawed-off shotgun, and that's mm. uh, that's how Mulligan killed him with a sawed-off shotgun of his own. So, so uh, came around and uh, and bit him in the ass, you might say. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, it definitely, there was something there, and it took him right out exactly as he took out uh, Patrick O'Rourke. Definitely, yeah. Almost very similar situation. Now, the next person coming up, I like the name. It's Rattlesnake Dick Darling. He went by multiple aliases, but I'm going to stick with the Rattlesnake Dick Darling. I just like, that's a great name. Uh, <laughs> you wrote that he was born in 1840 in Kentucky. Uh, he sold land in Omaha. Uh, all while he was under 21 years old, he, he left his home when he was a young man, not even an adult, and went out in the Nebraska Plains to make a living. Tell us yeah, about was, Rattlesnake uh, Dick Darling. That is a great story. Yeah, uh, when he shows up in Nevada, it's... It's very incredible. He was actually probably around 14 years old, 14 or 15 years old. And he was one of the first settlers of the Omaha, Nebraska area. And uh, because of that, he, even though he was too young to vote, uh, whenever there was an election came up, they would let him vote because he was one of the original settlers. And he actually uh, had an encounter with uh, a fellow named Erastus Beetle. Now, I don't know if you or your listeners are familiar with Beatles' dime novels, but they were uh, quite a popular thing for people to read in the uh, later in the 1860s and 70s and 80s. And uh, Erastus Beetle eventually became a millionaire on these dime novels. But at the time, he was looking to settle land in Nebraska as well, and he had an encounter with uh, Dick Darling where he was going to buy uh, Dick Darling's settlement. Now, apparently he didn't buy the settlement, but, uh, just an amazing, an amazing, uh, coincidence that this encounter took place. And also a coincidence that I actually found that information because, um, I didn't, it's kind of Nebraska is offset from, uh, Nevada. And I just happened to be reading a book on early Omaha history and, uh, it had Erastus Beatles' uh, diary in it. And he speaks of Dick Darling, and I thought, well, this can't be the same guy. But uh, I did research, and sure enough, uh, uh, basically ninety nine percent sure that it was him. Because when he After. when he had that land, the the idea with with Beetle was he was going west to make money, and eventually realized that the West wasn't for him, and moved back to New York, and then started the dime store novels. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy how it's uh, so, all linked together. That's crazy. Yeah, an amazing, amazing coincidence. Now, as time went on, he ended up in Utah. That was even another crazy. I was blown away by the Utah part <laughs> of it. And what happened there with a Mormon and his, you know, polygamy, because he was studying living by polygamy. And a lot happened in Utah. Definitely. Um, he became, uh, he, he, well, he kind of ingratiated himself into the Mormon uh, community. Um, he became friendly with the family of John D. Lee. And uh, I'm sure uh, most of your listeners are possibly familiar with the Mountain Meadows Massacre, um, which happened in the 1850s, um, where uh, Mormons and some Indians uh, massacred a, a settler company. Who were traveling through to California, and yep. John D. Lee was apparently uh, one of the uh, leaders of that particular incident. Um, but at this time, he's one of the high-ranking members of the Mormon Church. Um, Dick Darling becomes friendly with him, and he actually married one of Lee's daughters. And uh, as the story goes on, you become uh, familiar with Dick Darling. He's he was known to, I, I found at least three marriages that he was involved in, one of them being Lee's daughter, uh, but it said there was others, and he was quite, apparently quite a ladies' man. And according to uh, another Mormon, 
in his diary, he says that uh, Dick Darling not only slept with, uh, uh, well, uh, married one of Lee's daughters, but also slept with all of Lee's wives. I think there was 19 so, of them. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I, you know. He, he definitely had something going on. <laughs> he had something going on for sure. Uh, we're not sure what it was, but, uh, but there was something there. So that's kind of an incredible part of his story as well. Uh, then he eventually goes to Nevada uh, by 1863. Uh, he joined the Nevada Volunteer Cavalry. And uh, it's at this time, um, he's no longer with, uh, with Lee's daughter. Uh, he's either abandoned her or they're divorced or something of that nature. And he has another wife and, uh, he gets into a fight with this wife and she, she, sh- uh, shoots him. Uh, she, uh, unfortunately, well, <laughs> I was going to say unfortunately, but I mean, he didn't die, mm-hmm. but, uh, she, she, she grievously shot him. Uh, he survived that incident. And then he, he basically became, uh, sort of a criminal character, uh, uh, petty theft, highway robbery and so on. And he's involved in a, in a robbery in Virginia city in 1866. Um, which he is convicted of and he's sent to the Nevada State Penitentiary. Um, but he's given so a 14 a- year sentence, but he only, he only serves five years. He, he, he pardons, he puts a, a, an appointment to be pardoned and only serves five years out of the 14 and is released in 1871. Yeah, through good behavior and so on. Uh, I'm I'm thinking he was a very charismatic character. Yes. Um and so he got an early pardon. Uh he eventually in October 1871 teams up with another fellow named William Chamberlain, uh who was also an ex-con that he had met in prison. And they do a stage robbery and they're convicted of that and sent back to prison which uh Chamberlain is not too happy with Darling at this time because he believes that Darling gave his name to authorities to to uh, ameliorate his own situation. Um, so Chamberlain is not happy with this, but they end up both in uh, prison together in uh, Nevada, the Nevada State Penitentiary. Hmm. And uh, another incredible incident happens in the prison. Um right. He's, he gets involved in a prison escape. Well, there was the, the a major prison escape had happened uh, shortly after that. Hmm. Um, shortly after he was released, but before he was released, he uh, is in working in the prison stone yard with with uh, Chamberlain and. He, he ends up uh, knocking on the on the on the door of the uh, of the prison uh, leading into the stone yard. Uh, he says uh, he says to the authorities, uh, "You better come out here. There's a dead man laying out here. I just killed him." Mm. And, so, and so the prison authorities rush out, and sure enough, there's uh, Chamberlain lying in a pool of blood. Uh, Darling had killed him with a pickaxe. So. Mm. Just, and it's an amazing co- uh, contradiction for this character because he could do something like that. But he was also known to be a, quite an artist. He would do stonework, uh, make uh, stone cribbage boards and so on with elaborate designs on them. And uh, he would sell these. Uh, in it. And so it's just a, a controversy in that character's uh, makeup. Yeah, he did so much. He had such an amazing talent. And they could turn around and kill a man with an axe. Yeah. Mm. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe some of these characters, um, what they would do. Uh, and, you know, the talents they had and uh, in both for both good and bad, actually. But mm-hmm. Well, tell us, so about anyway, his, tell us about his death. How did he, because he, uh, he too passed away in a weird way. Yeah, he was finally released from prison in 1881, and he's traveling around the mining camps. He ends up in the camp of uh, Hawthorne, Nevada. Um, 
in uh, August 1883. And there he encounters another uh, former uh, ex-con from the Nevada State Penitentiary that he had met in the prison. And his name was uh, James Warren, who went by the nickname uh, Jimmy Fresh. And he was a small-time gambler and uh, a hanger out in the saloons and so on. And he got into a controversy with him for some... It's kind of obscure what, what really their problem was with each other. But uh, one day, uh, Darling walks into a hotel where he's actually working. He was, he was doing odd jobs as a stonemason. Again, his stonework apparently was uh, quite good. And uh, Warren saw him coming in. He knew there was trouble between them, and he thought, well, with a character like Darling, he's going to end up on the on the receiving end of a bullet. So he took the initiative, and uh, he killed uh, Darling, shot him dead on it, right on the hotel steps. <laughs> wow. So all three men faced a horrible demise. Either you were hung, you were shot in the stomach, or shot in the face. And that that is a continuing theme throughout. Uh, most of these characters in this book uh, went the same way, either by gunfire um, or some, some sort of violent means. Out of, it just seemed to be a continuing theme. Out of all the men or people you wrote about in your book, was there something that was so, and I've asked the question before, was there something so amazing or something so like, oh my gosh, no one's going to believe this? Because you, you researched a lot of people and there had to be something out of all the people you researched that you were like, oh my gosh, because you did a lot of the work with your wife. Did you look at each other and go, holy cow, they are not going to believe this? Well, actually, I think most of the characters, uh, just just their lives. Um, you know, to recall one particular incident, I can't really, uh, think of anything in particular, but just the amazing lives they led and, uh, the episodes they were involved in, um, just totally amazing. I mean, the whole thing is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's an amazing book. (laughs) Well, and if you want to get the book, it's called Nevada Gunsmoke. Frontier Fighters of the Boom Years from 1850 to 1890 by Elmer D. McGinnis. And uh, you can find it again at bookstores and, and places near you or at Amazon or you know, wherever you buy books. It doesn't matter where, wherever you live, small town, you can order it if they don't have it. And again, it's Nevada Gunsmoke Frontier Fighters and the Boom Years of 1850 to 1890. Are you working on anything for the future? You got something new coming out? Um, I do have another manuscript, uh, volume two of Nevada Gunsmoke, which I hope to uh, get published, which is already written. Um, so I'm hoping to get that published. Um, I have a local, a local history book on, uh, seven different incidents that happened with law enforcement, uh, right here in the Yorkton, Saskatchewan area, which I'm, uh, searching for a publisher for, which I hope to get that published soon in the near future. Mm. And I've got, I'm doing all kinds of research on, uh, California mining caps and on unknown characters, uh, uh, Nevada, some more on Nevada I'm researching. Uh, so maybe a volume three, who knows on that? I don't know if it can go that far, but, uh, um, also Arizona, I'm doing some research on Arizona characters. Um, just all kinds of research. I never stop researching. So I don't know if I'll have a, if I'll live long enough to get it all published, but, uh, I'm going to continue researching and get as many books published as I can. So hopefully the next thing will be uh, volume two of Nevada Gunsmoke. Will you come back and do a podcast on that? Yeah, we could do that for sure, Mike. That would be great. I'd appreciate the opportunity. Sure. Well, again, this is, uh, you've been listening to Elmer, Elmer D. McGinnis. He wrote a book called The Nevada Gunsmoke, uh, Frontier Fighters of the Boomtown Years from 1850 to 1890. Um, I also want to thank the folks over at uh, Tombstone Epitaph at tombstoneepitaph.com. That is Arizona's longest running newspaper, and it's real history about real, or I was going to say real history about real history. It's real history about uh, Arizona 
and the places that you love, and it comes right to your door. Of course, I want to thank everybody at the Wild West Citry Association. They're very kind and very supportive, um, and especially Roy D, uh, Roy B. Young uh, or at the Saddlebag. Uh, you definitely want to check that out online. Uh, tons. There's so much stuff going on. And Roy's updating all the time. And again, you can find it at wildwesthistory.org. And we hope to see you at the Roundup in Deadwood. And that'll be over July. And if you're interested in that, you can go to the Wild West History Association's website that I've been talking about, wildwesthistory.org. And you can find all about um, what's coming up. Susan, got a paper turning here. You can find all about what's coming up at Roundup in Deadwood in July. Um, Of course... Uh, I want to thank everybody here for listening. Uh, give me a rating and review. That helps me out uh, on podcasts. And hopefully you can subscribe if you're listening to Apple. Or you can do the same with uh, on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and I want to thank, too, our our, don- our charity of choice, St. Mary's Food Bank. We always thank them because uh, $1 makes 7 meals or feeds 7 people. You know, $5 is 35 meals, 35 people, or 100 bucks is, you know, 700 meals. I mean, it's crazy what they can do with a dollar. So if you have a food bank in a town near you, donate or go give some time or donate some money, and uh, they'll appreciate you, and I know the community will appreciate you too. Uh, do you have any charities or anything that you work with? Um, we have a food bank here in Yorkton as well, which... Uh uh, we like to donate to every so often and uh, help them out. Uh, there you so go. I, I think that's a that's a good thing for people to do. Absolutely, there you go. Elmer's in it, and um, of course, I always tell everybody to just be good people. You know, help out your neighbors. There's so much craziness going on in the world today. You know, moving in their trash cans or buying them dinner or a five dollar card, you know, for a free cup of coffee or a latte or whatever you drink, you know, something that uh, it just makes people feel good about themselves. You know, go do that. Just make the world a better place. Again, we're talking to Elmer. His book is Nevada Gunsmoke, Frontier Fighters of the Boomtown Years from 1850 to 1890. And you can find it at booksellers near you. Anything to add before we go? No, I just hope uh, people enjoy the book and, uh, um, Get maybe travel to some of these uh, places as you were talking about before, and and uh, getting a whole feel for the for the whole uh, situation. Yeah, like some of the places you can go to is El Dorado Canyon. That is actually open and available. It's just out of searchlight. Another area that um, would be cool to see, you have to get permission. Is called Miracle, uh, or no Mineral. Mineral Park, Arizona. Mineral Park, Arizona is out by Chloride. Um, it is a road, but the, the property itself and the cemetery and stuff is on private property. So you have to get permission. Uh, but a lot of the towns that are right there where these guys hung around, especially, um, where Hank Parrish hung around, a lot of those places are still there. You can go to Chloride, Searchlight, uh, El Dorado Canyon. Uh, there's tons of little places along that highway. I think it's a highway, highway 93 between Kingman and Las Vegas. You can get into Las Vegas and see some of the city, uh, see some of the history. And then Piochi, I always say it wrong. P- Piosh. Piosh. Uh, Piosh actually yeah. is there. And the cool thing about Piosh is not only do you get to see Piosh and the people that were there, but Peter Brand and I are doing a podcast coming up in the next week or two that is about Johnny Tyler. And Johnny Tyler spent time in Piosh as well. And so there's a lot of history, and that's only about an hour and a half, maybe hour and 45 minutes out of St. George. So it's St. George, Utah. So it's super easy to get to. You don't need four-wheel drive, and the town is readily available for you to go visit. And a fascinating cemetery there as well. Oh, my With gosh. a lot of some of these characters that I write about in that, in that cemetery. In Pioche? In Pioche, that's right, oh, yeah. Looks like I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have yeah. to make a trip. Yes, to do it. Okay. Well, thanks, bud, everybody. I appreciate you bunch. Uh, you can find me at Cochise County Travels on Facebook and Instagram. And then if you need to get a hold of me on email, you can do so through my blue collar email address of HVAC Reefer Guy. That's H V A C R E F E R Guy, G U Y H V A C Reefer Guy at gmail.com. That's my blue collar email address because I am, I do blue collar for a living. 
And uh, we appreciate you guys a bunch. And until next time, safe